Good morning, everyone. Hope you guys are, are doing well this uh, fourth uh, Sunday. Uh, wait, yes, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, super happy to, to be here. Glad that you guys are uh, with us as well. And then, of course, those online. Uh, last week, we kind of had an accidental um, thing with our sound, and it actually worked better online. So we're going to try the accident again. And uh, of course, sometimes when things are intentional, they don't work as well as accidents. So hopefully it will work as well online uh, with sound as it did last week, because you can actually hear people singing online, and that's like a first. That's pretty cool, because we want people to, you know, feel like we're, you're, you know, it's not a concert, right? We're uh, singing here uh, as a church family. So uh, just a couple announcements. Christmas Eve service is going to be uh, here. I think uh, Kenny and a couple of folks are going to try to figure out how we're going to have to space out a little bit more because there's plenty of room now. Christmas Eve tends to be a little bit more packed, so the, the, don't freak out if you come in here and things are a little bit uh, a little bit different. We won't, we won't have the chairs facing the, the opposite way. I promise you that. But other than that, I don't know what it's going to look like. Uh, it'll be an encouraging time. Uh, we'll do the candlelight 
uh, as well. Uh, also, we have Advent devotions, uh, devotionals out there in the back. Please grab one. Uh, I actually, you get bonus, you get bonus devotions this week because uh, it's a short week for Advent because Christmas is on the 25th again this year, right? Stay <laughs> that's one of the things that. We, 2020 did not take away our, our other day Christmas, right? So it's the 25th, but it's also Friday. So the, the devotions go through a couple days longer, so you have extra free devotions if you want. Uh, and those are in there. I hope that will be uh, helpful for you this season. This week, uh, we are focusing on peace. Our candle lighting, Advent reading will be focused on peace. We've done uh, lament, we've done longing, we've done joy last week, and then this week is peace. So. But with that being said, let me go ahead and um, enter into the time of prayer, and then we'll begin uh, our, our, uh, our time of worship. Father, we uh, need peace. Uh, we need, I need it. Uh, in a world that is filled with chaos and unanswered questions, uh, prayers uh, that we offer up that sometimes don't feel like they're being answered, um, we come into your presence hungry and thirsty for peace. You've seen it fit to limit our activities. Um, and while our activities have been more limited and we can't run from party to party, activity to activity, uh, that has not stopped our minds from wandering and wondering what if. Our hearts from running all over the place. Sometimes fear affects us and we feel like that balloon that's been full and then immediately let out of air and we're flying all over the place. But we come to the place of peace, even when we seem to be loyal subjects of fear, we are welcomed here by the Prince of Peace. Your grace releases us from that bondage of fear. And so Father, we ask that you allow us to taste your grace today through the power of the Spirit because of the work of the Son that we would experience peace, and that we would walk in the way of peace with one another. Lord, accomplish that peace in our hearts today, and we will patiently wait for you to finish the peace, the shalom, the wholeness, the harmonious reality of what one day will all be. Until that day, Lord, give us personal peace and continue to work peace in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I invite you to stand. We are going to uh, do a responsive call to worship. So I'll, I'll read the part of the leader. Please read the part of the congregation. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Let us hear the God of the Lord speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. We do to those who sin in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory and your praise. Let's glory and praise now.
Because of the tender mercy of our God, the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. From the Benedictus, Luke 1, 78-79. Prepare the way of the Lord. We write this candle. We light this candle in peace, the peace that Jesus, our Savior, gives to the world. He has reconciled us to the Father and to one another. Amen.
skips one minute. Thank you. Are you ready to sing now? Oh, I gotta finish this Christmas letter. Mm -hmm. It's been about three years, uh huh. Well, let's say that and assume I have tinge of less enthusiasm as a baby. But it's not to love. I mean, look at you. Such a glow you bring. What togetherness. What goodwill you stir up in the chest of mankind. Oh, such moths you make of each of us, attracted to shiny objects and all. It's out of the long standing love I have for you that I write. For all of our follow laws and the deck, the halls, well, a huge fan, of course, by the way, long-time admirer and supporter of every sleigh that is both one horse and open. <laughs> With every lovely side dish we've added, thankfully we've not yet overshadowed entirely the centerpiece around which the festive table is set. A long-awaited baby in an unexpected bed. Oh, high fives all around for that, would yes, because that baby means something to even the Grinchiest Scrooge among us. The silent night brings peace to our noise. Those herald angels sing hope over our humdrum. That star, it pierces our darkness. So, thank you for that. <sighs> oh. Perhaps we pin far too much to you already, but would you mind if I make one more request? With all our bells jingling and our snowmen frosty, would you promise me this Christmas, please? Don't compete with the cross. Because it, it might be tempting for us, you know. It might be a cinch for us to assume our carols and chimneys are the point. But today is so intently at the gingerbread houses that we can't focus on the Hebrew house of bread, also known as Little Town of Bethlehem. It could be tempting to sell for joy to the world and not to receive our king. Oh, I guess what I'm asking is, would you promise not to do it? This, this little baby here, oh yes, would you promise not to give us a feeding trough without a rugged cross. It's the brutal beams and the borrowed tomb which made him Christ after all. And, it's not, and if not for Christ, then where exactly is your Mary anyway? Whatever you do, don't take the cross from men who need nothing more than its tidings of comfort and joy. Hey, thanks for everything. You really are worth keeping all year through. Love, Martha. Oh, P.S. I'm dreaming super hard of a white Christmas down here, but I'm living in Warrington, Florida, for goodness sake. So if you could just work out something flaky with the snow miser or Mrs. Claus, that would be great. Well, whatever works. Whatever works. Okay, let me see. Oh, one more thing. We forgive you for the fruitcake. <laughs>
16, verses 1 through 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So, after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And when he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said to her, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered but, but, uh, for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well that was called Beer Lai Roy, sorry, that was probably not right, <laughs> it lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Please pray with me for our kids. Jesus, you came so gently and humbly into this world to live among us and to bear the weight of our sin that we might know redemption and salvation. What you offer is more valuable than anything that could sit under a tree. Thank you for working your restoration in our lives and in our children. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, kiddos. Birthdays on the bus there, so that should be a, a rowdy and exciting, exciting time. Sorry for you, Christy. <laughs> I'm up here without my glasses, which is a scary, scary thing. Thank you, Tom. Abby, thanks again for reading, and nobody knows how to pronounce those, so you don't even have to say that's probably not right. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't correct you if you wanted to. So you did a great job. Thanks for reading uh, that, as you always do. I really appreciate that. We're uh, on week four of the sermon series, uh, Questions First, questions that God asks us. Now, there's a lot of questions in Genesis, and there's some challenges, and and, and sometimes things can be challenging to believe. But we're going to look at the questions that God asks us. And we've been doing that for the last several weeks. And what I think that's been so helpful for me is that we don't normally think of God asking these questions, right? We ask questions to God. We're allowed to. Advent is a time where we say why. We say how long, Lord, or when will you return? Come, Lord Jesus. But it's also good to stop and let God ask us questions. And these are questions that God's asked from the very beginning. I came across an interesting interview this past week with Peter Billingsley. Do you guys know who Peter Billingsley is? He is the he is the actor who played the kid when he was a kid on the movie Christmas Story. Ralphie. He was Ralphie from Christmas Story. So uh, a fairly well known movie. You may have seen it. If you haven't, it's on TBS and on TNT for like 24 hours, Christmas Eve through the Christmas every year. Well, in the interview, he shared this interesting story. There's a scene where he, he dreams about being this like this Western tough guy, and he's fighting Black Bart or whatever the guy's Mad Bart. Or is it? Is it Black Bart? Black Bart. Okay, I don't know. something Bart. 
and uh, it's a bad guy, he's, and he's um, fighting them. And in that scene, he's got he's got what looks to be chewing tobacco. Of course, it's just raisins that, that are mashed up, and he's spitting. It looks like he's got chewing tobacco. Well, in the interview I saw, uh, that was not the first scene that they that they showed in the movie. Actually, the first scene, the stagehand uh, gave a 10 or 11 or 12 year old kid real chewing tobacco, red <laughs> chewing tobacco, and so it went how you expect it to go. He threw up and. He was sitting on the couch in a fetal position for 45 minutes, feeling sick afterwards. Uh, that, that was pretty fascinating. But there's an even more fascinating part of the interview that I want to share with you. He, and I think some of the cast members, didn't realize what a hit it would be, right? Because some movies just flop, or they go straight to Netflix, or of course back then they didn't have Netflix, so it would be straight to the, to the blockbuster. If you don't kids don't know what blockbuster is, you can Google it. It actually used to be a place where you could go and rent movies. Do you know that? Do you know that, kids? Connor, did you know that? Well, that's that's a fun fact there, buddy. You can you can Google it about the times of your and um, we used to go do that. But this is what he says about this movie. Um, he says to have something that stuck then and then every decade continues to, there's obviously a deeper core that it's hidden. And I think he's on something there, when you have any movie that stands the test of time, any book that stands the test of time, what do you have? You have a book or a movie that's hitting deep down to who we ultimately are, right? There's a reason why things are popular. It's not just because someone else sees someone liking it that's popular and says, I want to like it. it. That may be the case for like uh, boy bands and things like that that, are, that spring up. No offense to those who like boy bands. Um, but it'll spring up for a little bit. But for, for things that last, for music that lasts, something hits to the core. And that's why it lasts so long. If you pay close attention to the stories and the questions that we've been asking in this series, uh, even if you're skeptical of the historicity of some of these things, it's, it would be disingenuous, disingenuous to say that these questions don't accurately describe who we are at the core. I mean, we've looked at the first uh, questions God asked, where are you? And Adam and Eve sinned, and then what happened? They, they were naked, they felt ashamed. So what do they do? They covered up. That's not, not us, is that what we do? We do something bad, we feel shame, we cover up. The next question, why are you so angry? Such a question is timely for today. Why are you so angry? Well, we saw this it's always a form of self-righteousness. You didn't take my offering, God, or you didn't take my offering, my offering of advice, or my offering of time, and so what? And so what happens? I'm mad at you. And then anger leads to depression. Isn't that true? It's exactly what we experience. And then this question is a question of fear. And fear is not just timely for today. It's always been timely from the very beginning. The most common command in the Bible, I hope you know this by now because I've used this like eight times in sermons, the most often repeated command in the Bible is do not fear, right? All right, you guys are listening. All right. So do not fear. Do not fear. That's the most common command in the Bible. And at what age do we outgrow that fear? The old man Marley, the old creepy looking guy uh, from, he's not creepy, but he's just creepy looking at first, the old creepy looking man Marley, who is Kevin McAllister's neighbor and home alone, he says this. He says, you can be a little old for a lot of things, but you're never too old to be afraid. So what do we do when we're afraid? Because we're afraid at every age, and what that fear looks like, it looks different. When we're old, we don't say we're afraid, we say we're concerned. <laughs> I was watching a movie last night because I couldn't sleep. It was kind of a mafia-type movie. And uh, in the character, Robert De Niro said, when someone says they're con a little concerned, it means they're a lot concerned. And when someone says they're really concerned, they're really scared. <laughs> And so we may mask it in different ways, but we're all afraid. So I want to ask you two questions that God asked Hagar, this gal here. Two questions. And my points on the outline are just two points. Last week, someone told me, wow, he really finished his, uh, his last, he's st just still on his first point. Well, I've just forgotten to tell you my points. But two points here, they're on the outline, they're on the piece of paper, they're on the quotes section. I, I couldn't use all the quotes section in the sermon, so there's maybe some quotes out there that if you want to get them there, I think some of them are pretty helpful. Where have you come from and where are you going? So if you're lost, that's where you are. Where have you come from and where are you going? Now you see the angel of the Lord is 
here speaks to Hagar, and the angel of the Lord is described as God himself. He, God will sometimes take on forms in order to communicate to people. He doesn't have a body, but he takes on forms. He takes on the form here of an angel, and this is God himself doing this. And he's appearing before an Egyptian servant girl named Hagar, no relation, the Savior. <laughs> I don't know if that's where Satan got it from, but uh, he appears to this Egyptian gal named Hagar. And Hagar is obviously an Egyptian. She's a servant, so she's kind of a slave. Well, immediately the, the readers of this, the original readers of this are who? They're Hebrews. They're Hebrews who spent 400 years doing what? Where they, they weren't vacationing in Egypt, right? They're, they were enslaved in Egypt. So here is Moses writing this. He wrote the first five books. Right? And he's writing this to people who used to be enslaved by Egyptians. So here's this Egyptian gal who's been treated poorly, and she has now uh, entered into a, a scary wilderness area. She's pregnant. You know what? But do these readers, these original readers, care? She's an Egyptian. Why would we care about Egyptians when they treated us 400 years so badly? You know, sometimes people will say that um, religion or, uh, yeah, just religion in general is man's uh, projecting themselves up to the heavens to, and creating a God that looks like him or her, right? And that's an accurate assessment at times because we do create a God that looks like us. I mean, sometimes our God can be American, it can be Democrat, it can be Republican. Um, he can be high or he can be low. He can be wherever. He, we create a God that looks like us. We create a God who likes all the people that we like and hates all the people that we hate. And like, somehow likes the sports teams that we like. And we pray to him to win against other sports teams that other people think that God likes. All right? we, we do that. But look at this. This is not a God who Moses would create. We see a God who cares about the very people whom Moses and company would have no care about. Do you see that? This isn't a God that you would make up. You don't create a God who likes people that you hate. You don't do it. But that's the God that we see here in the Bible. We see God in the Bible interrupting our fears. He's entering our stories as we're running, not after we stop running. Well, you might say, well, she stopped, at a, yeah, she stopped at a rest stop. So she's driving down the interstate towards Egypt. If you can think about it that way, she sees a rest stop. She stops. She's going to get back going again. When does God meet her? He meets her in her running, not after she stopped running. In other words, he meets her not after she's cleaned up her life and changed directions. Are you with me there? God enters into our life as we're running, and he interrupts it graciously with questions. So there, to a woman that's running, he approaches her and doesn't just say, stop your running, go home. No. He asks her questions before he gives the command. And this is the pattern of grace that we see from the beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve were running, God asked questions. Not for, because he doesn't know where they are, He's gracious and he enters into that. He does, he dignifies, he doesn't demonize the fearful. Where have you come from? From where have you come? Adam dodged the question. Cain just skipped the question and went on to kill his brother. She's the first one that answers the question. And she answers it honestly. I'm fleeing from my mistress. That means she's that's that's her person that she's a, kind of a, a servant to, a slave to. So let's talk right now. Can you name what it is that you're afraid of? What you're fearful of? Can you actually just name it like that? Because that's a start. And that's what God invites us to. To be able to name our fear. Even be able to share that fear with other people. Name it. Name it. Be honest. But also let's be thorough with this. You see this? They're complicated. Are you with me there? Notice how they're complicated. I saw this meme the other day from... Uh, a friend of mine in Israel, I thought this was just absolutely hilarious, but also poignant as well. It should be up there on the screen. It, look at this one. It says, when you pray to God to remove your family's problem, and the next day you find yourself in heaven. <laughs> oh, goodness. 
I've often prayed that God would just remove the problem. <laughs> Sometimes we're the problem. I say that in jest, but that's part of the problem here. It's not only the mistress. It's also Hagar. And so God invites her now to, to retell. He invites us to kind of retell the story with some of the details that we tend to leave out. What's the problem? Him. What's the problem? This situation. What's the problem? Let's go deeper now. Okay, so look at verse 1 and following. Now, Hagar had a life that she hadn't sought, but this was a life that was handed down to her. It was a life that was handed to her, and she didn't handle it all that well, and others didn't handle it all that well, but guess where the problem started? It started with fear. You see, Sarah was promised, Abraham was promised, Sarah was promised, and I, I'm going to say Abraham and Abram, because later Abram changed, got changed into Abraham, and Sarai got later changed into Sarah. So if I, if I do that, I know that's not what you see up there, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm meaning, okay? So, God promised Abraham and Sarah a child. That was in Genesis chapter 12. Well, now we're in Genesis chapter 16. Chapters have passed. And chapters, sometimes there's a lot of stuff that happens in between those chapters of our lives, between where God promises one thing and when the fulfillment is way down the line. For chapters, chapters, and chapters, and chapters further down the line. And so Sarah begins to fear Maybe God's not going to follow through with his promise. It's a fear. And so what does she do? She decides to take matters into her hand. And just like the Grinch, she thinks up an idea. She thinks it up quick. But it was a terrible, awful idea. Now, in Sarah's defense, she didn't think of this all by herself. In fact, it was customary... It was custom of the day that you could bring in a surrogate woman to bear the child for you. Okay, that was that was customary. Hammurabi, maybe if my, one of your favorite Babylonian uh, lawmakers back in the day, uh, he's the one that uh, had some rules about this and what you could do with it. And so she's like, well, the, the culture's doing it, so I'm going to go ahead and borrow an idea from there, but I'm going to Christianize it. I'm going to Christianize it because we have this physical intimacy aspect, and we have a marriage, and those two go together. You don't have one without the other. That's, that's the design, okay? And so she says, I'm going to go ahead and give Abraham, I'm going to go ahead and give Hagar, my servant, to Abraham, not as just a surrogate mother, but as a second wife, okay? What could go wrong? <laughs> Abraham says, sure, let's do this thing. Now, before we go any further, we have to, you have to know this. The Bible reports polygamy here. That's, what's polygamy mean? More than one wife. Good idea, bad idea, Connor, Brandon? Bad idea. Bad idea. Yes, that was the only correct answer. <laughs> uh, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. Okay. The Bible reports it. It doesn't support it. And everywhere you see polygamy in the Bible, it's reported... And it's reported as a disaster. It does not go well. It's not God's design. It is always a disaster and never the design. So the Bible does not support that polygamy. just simply reports it. Okay, well, she gets pregnant. And then, of course, what happens? Uh, this woman, Hagar, who's been looked down upon her whole life. She's Egyptian. She's servant. She's unique. She's not part of the rest of the group. She's been looked down her whole life. All of a sudden, she now has something that Sarah wished she had. And that's being pregnant. And so she looks down with contempt. Why? Well, she's been looked down upon contempt. We looked about, we saw that in the first sermon series. When you feel contempt, you will show contempt. When you feel contempt, you will always attack some way. And so she does. And so she looks contemptuously, and that gets Sarah up into a big frenzy. She goes to Abraham, and after blaming God the first time, now she blames him, even though it's her idea. This is crazy talk. And then Abraham says, oh, easy there, Vic. easy there, easy there. And so what happens? He abdicates his leadership. He's afraid to enter into this mess that he said, okay, let's, let's go with that. Instead of trusting God's promise, we'll go with the surrogate, the second wife. 
He abdicates. He's afraid. He doesn't enter into this and tell her, hey, we need to, we need to deal with this. Instead he says, give her hell. Just, you, she's treating you bad. You go treat her bad. It says Sarah dealt harshly. And that word harshly is the same word that Moses writes later, or later in the book of Exodus for how the Egyptians treated the Hebrews. And as a, a reader of this, you just see the cycle, right? Harshness. Harshness. You treat me harshly, I'm going to treat you harshly. And it's just in the cycle. And so what happens when she's treated harshly, just like the Egyptians would later treat the Hebrews? She bails. She runs. And that's when God meets her. So you see, it's complicated, isn't it? She didn't handle it well. Of course, she was also treated very harshly. The punishment didn't fit the crime. The title of the sermon, you may recognize it from the, from the late or early 2000s pop genre from Avril Lavigne. Why did you have to go and make things so complicated? Is that the question that God asks her? You know what? If you had not treated Sarah with contempt, basically, this would be easy to deal with. We could go back, we could say, Sarah, come on. I mean, seriously, you treated her harshly. It would be easy, you would be clean, but oh no, it's complicated. They both messed up. Abraham messed up. They're caught up in this compilation of complications. And God enters into our complicated situations. We have complicated situations that we're all experiencing now. The good thing is that even when we think that there is no way to get out of the mess that we're in, God enters in. He enters in with this question, where have you come from? We can be honest, we can be thorough. I love this line here. I, I follow one of these commentaries that I'm helping you use to study this, and there's one commentary that's very succinct. I like this one here. Divine mercy brings good out of human folly. In other words, you can't mess up your life. You can't mess up your story. You can't mess up God's grace for you. You can't complicate things so much that God says, why did you have to go make things so complicated? Where have you come from? The next question is, where are you going? God brings peace to a complicated situation. He says, return to your mistress and submit to her. He meets us in our running, but he never leaves us in our running. Right? This was not a good idea for this woman to flee to Egypt, right? Again, what could go wrong? Someone who's pregnant in this day and age returning to Egypt. What could go wrong on the way there? Well, God cares about her so much, and he cares about us. He meets us in our running, but he never leaves us in our running. He cares where we come from, but he also cares where we're heading. When we fear, we are always going somewhere. And we are going to go to the place that we know the most. She's Egyptian. She's on the road to Shur. She's heading towards where? Egypt. She's heading back home. We know we go where we know. And that's exactly what she does. She goes home. Remember, who was Moses writing this to? He's writing this to Hebrews. Where do Hebrews, where are the Jewish people, where are they tempted to go back to? When, once they leave slavery in Egypt, where are they tempted to go back to? If you've read the Bible at all, if you haven't, let me tell you where they go. They want to go back to Egypt. Why? This is what they knew. I mean, there's 400 years of slavery, but yeah, we eat fish, we have vegetables. This is just what they knew. We're like water. We always run to the, to the lowest, to the most easiest, to the most comfortable, to the most noble place. And yet where we know best is often not the best. And so maybe we run and we, we run home. We, we stay home. And again, I don't, but I have the COVID, COVID caveat everything. I'm not talking about COVID fears. I'm talking about the fears where we just want to stay home and avoid everybody. That's one of the places we go when we're scared. Sometimes we go to substances. Maybe it's alcohol or drugs. Why do people do that? 
mean, sometimes we all talk to our kids. You know, they're like, well, Dad, why, why, do we, why do we go there? Why do people do that? Because it just ends up, you know, either, either getting caught, because athletes, you know, will do that, or, or they'll end up on the streets. Why do you go there? Just, we're afraid. People go there when they're afraid. They go to substance. Maybe it's nostalgia for a place or a time. Oh, man, I just got to go back in my mind to a place and time when things were so simple. <laughs> things were not complicated. Or um, sometimes, sometimes we may go back to a relationship that we know, a relationship that we shouldn't go back to, right? To an unhealthy relationship, just because we know that person will be there, and, and we may go into places where we shouldn't go with them. Or if you're like me, this is the worst place, this is the place I go. Sometimes we're afraid, where do we go? We go to the worst possible scenario in our minds. Do you ever do that? I hope you don't, but I do. What's the worst possible scenario that could happen if this situation would play itself out? We go there. But God interrupts our running. And he redirects us. And let me go ahead and copy this thing one more time. Uh, there have been a lot of bad pastors over the years. I, I don't need to defend bad pastors. Are you with me there? There are pastors that have sent people back into abusive relationships. That's not going to happen here ever, okay? So this is not an abusive relationship that he's sending her back into. And if you are in an abusive relationship, God is not calling you back into that abusive relationship. Please just nod and say that you get that. Yes, we don't, we don't believe that here. There's been a lot of bad pastors that have told people bad things and have harmed them. So th this is not what I'm talking about. So if you're fleeing from a relationship that you, that you should be leaving, okay, Please don't hear me say that you need to go back there. That, that's not what this is about. You give me one more nod so I can do Okay, thank you. But you know why I have to do this? Because people have done this, right? They've twisted the scriptures and they use it to fit their own narrative, okay? So we know that, okay? So again, it's complicated, right? It's complicated. That's why I can just say that and, and it doesn't mean that you have to go there, okay? So what do we need to do with this? Well, this is not a question of safety here because she is going to bear a child. The child's going to grow up. She's going to be able to at least take care of that child. It's going to grow up into a nation. So it's not a question of God calling you back into an abusive relationship. Okay? This is a question of ease, of comfort, of convenience, of control, of influence. This is not an abuse situation, but this is, a, this is a situation where Hagar is going to lose ease. She might lose some comfort there because it's going to be awkward, right? She's going back as a mistress and as Abram's second wife, but she's never going to be the gal. Again, that's why marriage is not meant for, for two women, right? Okay? She's never going to be the gap. So she's going back into an awkward situation. But Lord, it's complicated. I know. It's complicated because how did, how did they find out she was leaving? She probably put on her Facebook status, it's complicated. <laughs> and and tag herself or rest off on the way to sure. You know? that, that's how it probably would have unfolded in today's, in today's world. Right? Things did not end well, obviously. They didn't leave on good terms. She would have to apologize for, for being contemptuous. Now, again, there's probably nothing worse that you could do to a woman in this time period. A woman who desperately wants to be pregnant, you get pregnant, and then you look down upon her. Do you understand that? That is like the lowest of the low insults. That is the shame of all shame. And she did it. She's going to have to go apologize to Sarah. That's going to be awkward. Right? I can't imagine how awkward this reunion would be. And yet he says, return to your mistress. This is not the easiest life. But it is the best and it is the one that's peace. And let me tell you the good news here. Returning does not lead us to peace. Peace leads us to returning. This is not a story of, you go back, and I'm going to bless your socks off. You go back, and you're going to win a brand new car. 
you go back, and this is what's going to happen. No, there is peace first. It is the peace that leads to, to return, not the return that leads to peace. As soon as God gives this command to return, he promises what? He promises her offspring. What does that mean? Sarah isn't going to kill you. <laughs> it's going to be awkward, but you're going to get through it. Your baby is going to be born, right? Because there's miscarriages. And there's a promise here. Your baby's going to be... So he tells her, it's going to be okay. I'm calling you to return because that is the best place for you to be. Not going back to Egypt. The best place is for you right here. And so God knows what's good for her, even though she is confused. Does she get all her what if answers? What if questions answered? Of course not. Because she's going to have to apologize, but then will Sarah apologize? I don't know. That was a pretty crazy situation right there. That's Jerry Springer. Sometimes we go into situations where we're going to apologize, and guess what? They're not going to apologize for what they did, right? Because she needs to apologize, but oh, Sarah can't be treating people harshly like that, treating them like slaves. No. There's going to have to be, will reconciliation happen? It doesn't end that well with them. They have to leave eventually. <laughs> I'll tell you the rest of the story. So, but look, the Lord is good, and he provides her something more than a kid. More than a nation. Look what she says. She says, So she called the name of the Lord and spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. I don't have to see everything as long as I don't see him. We could get an angelic visit. And that would answer a few questions. We have some questions of our own. But guess what? This angelic visit doesn't answer all the questions. You can never have all your questions answered. So what's greater than having your questions answered? To be known, to be seen, to be looked upon. And what is this? Adam and Eve, when God looked upon them, what they do after they sin? They hid. It was fearful. Now to be looked upon oh, with favor. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine always being looked down upon? And then all of a sudden to be looked upon with favor. What, what this means is that it's not just that God puts up with her, but that God likes her. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? To be rejected, to not be liked, and all of a sudden to realize that even in my sin, even in my sin, God can look upon me and say, I like that guy. I like that guy. I like that girl. And that's powerful. You know, when you have favor, you don't have to have all your questions answered. You really don't. To borrow a line from Cousin Eddie, that favor is the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. I mean, it really is. You could have an angelic visit. But that doesn't kid continue to, to, to deal with the next hard situation, the next awkward scenario, the next situation that you've got to go back into. No, but favor does. This is not a face your fears sermon. Okay? This isn't self-help. You've got to go face your fears. Go get them, tigers. No, you don't face your fear, you face your favor. And that's what she does. She looks up and she's God who has looked upon her favorably. Tim Keller says this about the Bible, how we misread it sometimes. He says, we usually read the Bible as a series of disconnected stories with a moral for how we should live our lives. It is not. Rather, it comprises a single story telling us how the human race got into its present condition and how God through Jesus Christ has come and will come to put things right. That's what the Bible is about. And so the story, the same story, picks up in the New Testament with Luke and the scared shepherds. And what do you see? You see an angel of the Lord shone around them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news and great joys that will be for all the people. So it's not just for this gal. It's for us even today. Now, it says an angel of the Lord. Why does it say the angel of the Lord? Oh, where is the angel of the Lord? Let's go to the next slide. Where is the angel of the Lord? For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped and swaddled in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, 
in our earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Where's the angel of the Lord? He's in the manger. And that will, this is an angel bringing, an angel is bringing the message about the angel of the Lord who has come down and has come to be born. And one of the things that I was thinking about when we were singing that uh, Away in a Manger song, um, you know, there, there is something to old Ricky Bobby uh, in, in uh, Talladega, whatever, the Bell Nights, of sweet baby Jesus. You know, he did grow up, he did die on the cross, but he was also a baby. Right? And this baby here, God was born in the flesh. He didn't just assume the figure of an angel, he assumed the body of a kid. He was born in straw poverty. Okay, that, 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 is, that is pretty amazing. So now we can have favor with God. Favor, look, how do we have peace? Among those with whom he's pleased. If God looks upon you with favor, you can have peace. Why is that? Or how is that, and then why is that more close? Well, how can that be? You go to this next slide. This is a conversation. I just love this scene between Marley, uh, the older guy there, and uh, Kevin, who's the Macaulay Calkin, uh, right there. If you remember this scene, this is what happens in this scene. It, the older guy asks the younger guy, have you been a good boy all year? He says, yeah, kind of. Uh, pretty much. And then he says, do you swear on it? And Kevin goes, nope. <laughs> he knows it. He knows it. Look at what Kevin's teaching us. No, he's teaching us. No, it's complicated. Yes, my family's been hard to me, but I've been hard to my family. Yes, they've been difficult to me, but I've been difficult to them as well. Yes, they've sinned against me, but I've sinned against them as well. Where do you go when you want favor? Where do you go to experience peace? Do you go to Jesus? Because Jesus is the one that provides the favor. Can we at least admit, like Kevin, no, we haven't been good boys and girls the whole year. <laughs> we haven't. But the good news is that Jesus has for us. That's why he came. He didn't come to be an example. He does, he does show us as an example, of course, right? He shows us how to love, shows us who to love, who to touch. And again, it's not just people that you like, it's people that don't like you. People down and out. He, he does that. So he, he does show us how to live, but he lives for us. He provides us the peace. This next uh, quote here is pretty helpful for me. C.S. Lewis. You see, friends, before the new clean world I give you is seven hours old, a force of evil has already entered into it. Do not be cast down. Evil will come without evil. But it is still a long way off. And I will see to it that the worst falls upon myself. Another reason why we can take comfort when we have favor with God, we recognize that we can't do it ourselves, but that he does it for us, he has paid the price. Another reason why we can have favor with God, or another reason we can have peace, is just the worst thing we fear has already happened to Jesus. The worst thing that could possibly happen to you has happened to Jesus if you believe in him instead. Isn't that good news? Yeah. So I don't have to fear 2021, or 2022, or whatever, whatever is next. The worst has happened to Jesus instead of us. And if we believe that, what happens? When we believe that you have favor, that's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. That's the gift that keeps on giving the whole situation, any situation that we have. And so let's, let's finish this out. Let's land this point. If there's situations, there's family situations, um, there's relational issues, there's a situ there's an experience that you that you've run from. Uh, consider this; it's complicated, right? Where have you come from? Be honest. Share those fears, and then where are you going? Is God calling you back into that? Again, it's complicated. I'm not talking about abusive situations here, but we so often say, "Well, that's inconvenient, Lord. So you obviously don't want me to go there, right? You've closed doors. The Lord's closed doors because this would be inconvenient for me to enter into." Well, remember, the worst has fallen upon Jesus. If that's the case, we can enter it anywhere if we're called to. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of your grace. I pray for anybody here who may not have experienced that peace, uh, that now we can recognize, no, we've not been good, we've not been perfect, but you have. And so we don't have to feel bad all the time walking around. Instead, we can feel peace. So, Father, fill our hearts with peace. The world's scary. Uh, relationships are scary. Our family can be scary. 
our neighbors to be scary, whatever it is that might be causing us fear, Father, please let us be able to, to hear those questions. And let's hear you asking the questions. And let us conclude the way that Hagar does. I have God who sees. I have God who sees me. Father, let us understand that if you see us, we're going to be okay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, let's go ahead and um, conclude our worship with, uh, with singing. If you want to give our offering, um, we have an offering box in the back for our donations. Uh, you can keep doing it after the new year if you want to, uh, if you want to get a tax. Marie, what is, the, what is the deadline for it? It's got to be postmarked by the 31st. As long as it's postmarked by the 31st, you can get a donation in and receive the uh, whatever that is, the charitable giving thing, or you can give online if you want to. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let's close out the song. We got a good one. Say that, please.
good word today. That's what benediction means. Here's God's good word for you uh, today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and go in his peace and favor. Amen. Amen.